So now we're going to move on to our quantifying happiness panel. I'm very excited about this panel. Um, we have Steve, who is going to be hosting and moderating. Um, so come on down, Steve. This is going to be the price is right here. Um, then we have Dom. And Dom is a design researcher at Motivate Design. And I apologize. Steve is the principal scientist here at Hello Wallet in DC. Then we have Dave. Um, he is the product manager and UX researcher at Add This. And we also have Hilding. And Hilding is the director of research and insights here at Sapient. And finally, we have Dustin. And he is the senior vice president of uh, uh, MadPow. Is, did, I, did I say that correctly? <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, and he is the behavior, behavior, change, behavior change design main person at MadPal. So thank you all for coming. And we're going to kick it off with Steve. Hey, everybody. When we build products, when we market them, to our users, to our consumers, to our clients. We often think squarely about the value proposition. Are we serving a need? Are we delivering what people are looking for? And we think that if we build the greatest product in the world that solves that need, people will love it, they will tell their friends about it, and our products will be successful in the market. But increasingly, we're looking beyond just that simple value proposition, and we're looking at something a bit more fundamental. What's the experience? What do people remember about interacting with you? Are they happy with how you've made them feel? Are they happy with that interaction? And so the, and these more fundamental questions are much more about differentiation, about, the, uh, about more than, OK, yes, you solve a need, which often for most of our products, for most of the work we do, there are many other competitors who could do that. And we do something special we make people remember us, and we give them emotion, we give them happiness. And Intuit has this, for example, they talk about designing for delight, for giving something that is so memorable. Um, Dan Schaefer talks about the micro interactions, the tiny parts of an application's interface and one's experience with it that make or break your understanding of, the, of that whole experience, the seemingly trivial details of is it easy to click the button? Does it give you a, a nice memory? Oh, that was a nice sound, whatever it might be. And so, in fact, the, the, as you guys may know, the theme for World IA Day this year is all about happiness, architecting happiness. Now, the challenge with that is it's fuzzy. What's happiness? We each have our own definitions. We each have our own meaning of what that is. And so, especially when we work in teams in our companies or we compare with others in the field, it feels like a, a moving target or, or perhaps no target at all. And so in this panel, we want to fix that. So we have a diverse set of perspectives and backgrounds working in the industry who will talk about what does happiness actually mean and how do we quantify it. And so really, that's, uh, I've, I've got a set of questions for the, for the panelists today. I'm going to let them really introduce themselves and talk about it. And we're going to have a discussion. We're going to have a discussion amongst the panel. And hopefully, we'll have a discussion with you guys as well. So uh, we'll, we'll go through, in the beginning, two core questions for each of our panelists, starting with, um, starting with Dustin. We'll start with, what is happiness in your work? And how do you measure it? Short, succinct, what is this? And then we'll dig into deeper questions like, OK, how is that different in different contexts? Um, uh, how do we actually go about shaping that, architecting, uh, architecting happiness, as is the theme, et cetera. And would love to hear your questions throughout the, uh, throughout the panel. And that's it, guys. So that's my part. Now they will do the work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> so uh, Dustin, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I guess I'm up first. Hey. Um, so the work that I do um, the, at MadPow is a uh, my job and my team is we specifically design products and services with clients to facilitate uh, positive, healthy behavior change of individuals, populations, things like that. Health, um, pro-social behavior, sustainability, financial capabilities. Um, happiness has a, a huge uh, part of what we do. And we define it in two different ways. Um, delight, as Stephen talked about, we frame uh, as hedonic happiness. 
And when you're looking to change someone's behavior, increase their capabilities, we frame that as uh, eudaimonia. So uh, increasing someone's capacity to live their version of the good life, which comes in a lot when you're an organization that's designing in products and services to change behaviors of somebody underneath them. So we separate those two things, and we'll get into some details about that after. Great. Hi, guys. I'm Dave Jays with uh, Add This. You probably know us as a sharing button company. You know, we create tools to make uh, your website uh, look great and, and uh, get your users to share it. Um, in addition, we think of joy uh, or uh, happiness in terms of kind of two two different aspects as well. Um, the one where it's easy to use, um, it looks great, it's an enjoyable experience, which is which is more joy. Um, the thing we're, we're also shifting towards is how can we help you as a website owner um, be more successful to drive success, whether that's in connecting with your audience, uh, whether that's in driving core metrics, and that's similar where, um, you know, Dustin talks in terms of uh, well-being, but it's also in terms of fulfillment, right, accomplishment, mastery. Um, and so uh, that, that's something that we look at and try to architect for um, our users of our, of our system, how they can drive more success and, and, and enjoyment from their website. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dom Crockett. I am a design researcher at an experience design company called Motivate Design. Um, I would say that my superpower is at my field, is, in, my, in my position, is taking user research insights and making them applicable to overall brand strategy goals for my client. Um, and making it just meaningful and actionable. Um, in terms of happiness, I believe that happiness is, a, is about alignment. It's about a personal set, extremely personal set of criteria that somebody has and whether or not that's, um, whether or not that's met by the product or service or thing that they're being used. Great, thanks Tom. My name's Helding Anderson. I'm a director of research and insights with uh, Sapien Nitro. Been with the company most of my career, almost 17 years. Uh, and you know, when we think about happiness, we really think about it from the perspective of, of experience and, and delivering a quality experience. Most of our, our clients tend to be a little bit larger, um, tend to think about you know, um, omni-channel and, and kind of cross-channel experiences and how do you connect those experiences in a way that, that will impress and ultimately delight your customers. You know, a lot of uh, uh, advertising agencies and others have have focused on kind of this push model of uh, of communication and, and sort of uh, uh, telling your story but, but we believe that there's an opportunity to think think a, a different view basically and and to try to develop something that is about about the right experience about pulling people in to, who want to engage with your product with your experience and that you can also measure the delight and the happiness that comes out of that So we've already seen quite a range of, all right, we have fulfillment, we have mastery, we have the experience. I'd love to dig in a particular example. So what does it mean when your users are happy? So we have the, the client contacts using software. We have the end users um, who are experiencing it in a very different way, different contexts of this interaction. So maybe we can dig in and give some examples. For everyone. I'm sorry, I was thinking you start. first, but uh, I would love to see like the contrast between yeah. add this yeah. and yeah. Sapien yeah. Nitro. We're going to jump in there. Yeah. Yeah. Be a little faster. Go to so uh, lean the, forward a little bit. Though. The question, the question was around uh, mastery and how we measure that that experience and that happiness, right? Um, so if you look at uh, happiness, uh, you have some some sort of a long term fulfillment goal, and then you have accomplishments along the way, right? And that's that's one of the greatest parts is is when you find out about these accomplishments um, and you use those to drive e either further action or further development. Um, and so we measure that in terms of you know overall satisfaction with our software. We use Net Promoter Score and just you know how happy, how likely are you to recommend our our software um, in terms of longer term engagement, what we do is we look at, are, are, do you continue to use the tool? We want to be kind of a, a central part of your daily daily workflow. So, um, you know, some indirect measures there. Do you continue to log in? Um, how many of our tools are you using? Um, and then when we start to send alerts, hey, you know, you had a, a, a great day. Tons of people shared your content. That's awesome. Um, you know, how, how likely are you to click through on that? And we've seen some really great results on those types of, uh, of alerts where you give somebody good news. Um, you know, they, they tend to click through on emails, um, you know, up to 10 times more than, than, than a regular marketing email. And so that's really great feedback to see um, and one of our core measures. Do you want to give, or Dom, do you want to give an example? Sure. Uh, when it comes to uh, evaluating happiness with 
my client, my user, my boss. For me, it is about the examining and the establishing of criteria for that happiness. I think it's very paramount to have a conversation with whoever the other, who, whomever the other party is to really figure out what does that criteria of happiness look like for that individual person or individual people and if and making sure that I'm doing everything or I'm designing everything that meets up to that criteria in a way that makes them happy, that, um, that checks all the boxes that we have established. Now, delight comes when you go above and beyond that. When someone's delighted with your progress or your work, that's when you have exceeded their expectations. But being happy with something, being content, being uh, able to um, use it and keep using it, I think is a result of establishing a criteria, knowing, knowing yourself well enough and that person well enough to figuring out if, that's, if that criteria is in scope and delivering. So Donald, let's, let's push a little further. So what, what are those boxes? What are those criteria? Give us, give us a concrete example. What does that mean? Depending on what the platform is, if it's a website, is it legible? Is it accessible via all the different platforms that I want to use? Is it going to um, inspire the customer to keep going forward in a journey with my, co with my company or with my, my service? Um, all of those things are things that have to be checked. Those boxes have to be checked in order for someone who's using these things, in order for them to be happy with whatever they're using. Yeah, and I just building on that, I mean, I think, I think that's, that's great and that's exactly right. And I think one of the things that we've really struggled with is, is once you move past the kind of the tactical metrics of you know, web performance or even of a given channel performance, how do you, how do you start to think holistically? And so we actually did um, you know, some research, some proprietary research on this where we went out and, and tried to think of what is the right model for connecting. And what we, what we came up with, and it's not perfect, I don't think, um, uh, and something we're still working on, but it came up, there are kind of three quadrants. There's this idea of this, the, the core brand and marketing, sort of traditional ROI of, uh, uh, of using some of the web channels. But there's also, there's a return kind of on media and channels. So if you do a media buy, you can measure that and optimize it. And there's a lot of work that's, a lot of change that's happening there. And then there's something I think that's new, um, and that's this concept of experience optimization. Um, and we, borrowing from, actually from architecture, um, we, kind of explore this idea of um, uh, five experience dimensions, which, which try to get into, I'm not gonna go through them all now, but, but try to get into this idea of how do, you, how do you quantify or measure something that's fundamentally very, very difficult uh, to, to measure. Uh, and those dimensions, you know, the sense, kind of what is the emotional connection with a, with a product, control, how, how much control can you get with that experience? Um, is it a good fit? So the fit is the third one. Continuity and access are, are two others. Um, and I think, it, but I, it, ultimately, it's a very challenging question. I think, right? Is is how do you take once you like we all get these tactical metrics, but once you move past that, you know, what are you know how do we really know what the user is doing? Uh, and I know you're you know an ethnographer and and do spend a lot of time talking to users and exploring that. And so it's um, you know it's a it's a real challenge. I also find that in talking to users, it, it they, they may not be as eloquent and articulate as to what will make them happy and delightful. But people are very clear on what doesn't make them happy and where they have like really had an experience where like, I never want that to happen again. This chain of processes in this app, in this service, uh, in this experience was really terrible. Let me tell you why. And probing on those and really figuring out how that experience was offensive to the idea of their best self is really important. So that raises a question. Do we focus on the people who are doing well? Or do we focus on those who really absolutely hate what we're doing? I can take it from, from my perspective, <clears throat> which is a little different, I think. Uh, again, the, the work that we do, um, for, for behavior change is really about taking people who uh, are either perceived by our, uh, our client uh, and to get people to do better at something, to change their body mass index, to be more financially capable, uh, to uh, you know, uh, be more ecologically minded. When you're looking to change behaviors of a population that 
um, someone else feels like their behavior should be changed, it's really important to connect with those people. Behavior change is a messy process of behavior and motivation and attitude and affect, uh, values and beliefs. It's really, really important to connect to those things um, and help people change in a way that they want to change. Setting up the goals that they want to set up, uh, agreeing on those metrics with the client, giving people targets to strive for, but putting that power and that control, much like in, in other product design, into the hands of the users to ensure that it meets uh, metrics of the client looking to change these behaviors. Um, from a measurement standpoint, um, we do things a little bit differently too. We, we go straight to um, vetted psychological scales, for example. If we're working on a, an intervention for depression or anxiety, we use things like uh, PSQ-9 or DAS, these um, psychology scales. And as part of the process in, in building and in testing, uh, we want to set up to get baseline data, uh, so have people do experience sampling to get data, uh, and then test those numbers. Uh, other techniques as well, but, but uh, test those scales uh, at the beginning, uh, during the uh, interventions, post-interventions, and different kinds of follow-ups. But focusing on, on those that are not doing so well, but doing it in a way that doesn't target them as necessarily people who are doing something wrong or not doing something well. I just think in this day and age, it's, it's so hard to force someone to come to you. I mean, if you're, if you're in that situation, I mean, it's something you've already lost to some extent. And I think a lot of what we're, you know, our clients, many of them have, you know, many traditional advertising um, uh, customers come to it from that perspective. Like, look, okay, we need more people. We just need to throw more, you know, we need a bigger, bigger billboard, right? It's a problem. We're not going to get enough customers. And that's, I think that has fundamentally changed. Um, and that we do a lot of conversations now about ecosystems and, and how do you, you know, think about, you know, kind of cross-channel. How, how do you make people want to come to you? And, and that's, I think, what you described is a big part. You know, one other thing that comes to mind here, we, we did some work, um, actually a company we acquired did some work with um, the Blair Witch Project, and they looked at, you know, the intensity of fandom around that online, and they've been involved with a number of different, uh, number of different projects. And what they found is that when they looked at it, there were really, you know, a couple different types of people who want to engage, who really, you know, who, in terms of social engagement, who want to be part and participate in these types of experience. There's the, this kind of dipper that just kind of dips their toe and then, and then leaves. Um, there's a skimmer, someone who gets in a little bit more, and then there's a diver who's like all in, right? And we all know like certain brands attract that type of all in. And the question is, how do you think about and build enough engagement, build enough happiness where you can drive behavior across those groups in what, you know, kind of whatever way that you want to make sense? But it's not, uh, it's not forcing that behavior. It's, it's, it's trying to enable and build the right tools to put a smile on someone's face, to let them engage with it. To, you know, I think of Dis we, we visited Disneyland as part of one of our studies. And you know, on one hand, incredibly controlling experience. And I'll, I'll hand it off to you guys. But incredibly controlling experience, right? You, know, you go in, there's you kind of lockstep. You get in line. I mean, they're doing a lot of great stuff, a lot of digital stuff. But it's also just, just a really rich experience as well. And you get this group of people who are so passionate about the brand that even though it's controlling in this day and age, they're able to look past that. And they're able to just, just revel in it. And, and some of those people are kids, but, but, but not all. Um, uh, and so I think as you think about happiness, there are many different ways that brands can start to engage and drive um, and build the right experiences with happiness. But, but fundamentally, you've got to you know, be smart about you know, who are you targeting, how are you, how are you doing it, how are you measuring it. Um, and, and there are a lot of different models for that. Those are some really great points around driving driving uh, fandom um, because if you are, if you're just measuring and just testing with people who are dissatisfied with your product, all you're going to end up with is a, a relatively satisfactory product, right? Um, however, if you you know, and that's a that's a good baseline. That's always something you want to do. But if you if you overall want to increase you know passion with your users around your brand, then ultimately you're going to want to find those people that are the most passionate about them. Um, and to Dustin's point, you also want to figure out how you fit into their life, right? So is it is it just about providing a good experience? You know, I had a, a great checkout process at the at the at the store or something like that, and that was good. Um, or what what what? Uh, how do you help those people actualize their life, right? How do they identify with you, um, either as you know a, a luxury or as an essential, uh, as part of becoming a better uh, financial or or health uh, decision maker? And some of the previous questions raised a really uh, previous comments raised a really interesting question, which is on this. 
how do you affect happiness? And especially when sometimes it's clear that that's the goal, that people come to Mad Pow, they come to uh, some of the behavior change applications you guys develop, and they expect to exercise more. They expect to do whatever. But in other contexts, it is built into the user interface, and you want people to be happy with it. But you're not explicitly saying, hey, we are constantly trying to make you happy while using our product. So how do you address, so first of all, how do you address the making improvements? And then maybe as a follow-up, I'd love to talk a little bit about how do you handle the transparency there of, of really what you're doing? I think that the points that all my, panelists, my panel members have brought up is about uh, I heard a lot about like you know trajectory and ecosystems of happiness, and I think it's to the point of what what we are trying to do is transcend this feeling of happiness into a trajectory of happiness, right? So you don't just want the singular feeling of oh I'm happy and then I never feel happy again. That's not very enjoyable. But if we understand the factors that can cause people to be happy. We, if, if, if we're transparent about wanting to know more about our users in order to build that trajectory of happiness, um, I think that that would yield more sustainable results. Um, so what are the tools? What do you actually do differently to make your users happy? I think just, I, I'm, Kind of, kind of like being a good friend, being open, being open to feedback, being open to having the product or service be a conversation with the user as opposed to it just being this entity that they are um, looking at and, they, and they, they don't, there's no face to it. You gotta build the right product. I mean, I think you gotta build the right product because it's, if, you know, it's about the right feature. I don't know what they are. I mean, it depends on the customer, right. I mean, as you know, it's, you know, but what's the right, the right tool for the job. If the, if the job is trying to, to do that, you got to understand your customers. You got to do the research, the user research it takes to, to assess that. You know, there are a number of different techniques, prototyping all through the entire discovery process. I mean, so. Pandora and Netflix make people happy because they listen to the people who are using it. You get recommendations based upon what it is you like or what it is you don't like. That, at, I think, at a very small level, is this idea that this platform or service is it's it's like a it's like a friend it's somebody who's listening to you and learning and adapting to who it is you are that's a great point and that's a good a good example of the control right where you have feedback and you can continue to uh, to shape that experience a anytime you're looking at like a long-term trajectory as well um, all of these things like if you're talking about like uh, career mastery or if you're talking about losing weight these are kind of long roads right and they're easy ones to fall off of and so um, one of the things that's really important to establish is, is action loops so feedback and action loops here's here's how you've done here's how you've progressed here's maybe some feedback that could help you um, and then here's the next step that you can take Right, and there's there's no no um, better time uh, to to ask somebody to do something than w when you've just told them some great news. Right, here's great news. You're doing great today. Now try this, and you'll do even better. Right, um, and so those types of uh, uh, notifications and action loops uh, I, are are like little mini interventions that can help somebody along their path. Um, I think you've you've done some work around that, right, Dustin? Yeah. So <clears throat> feedback loops are are essential uh, part of any design process, as mentioned uh, when Steve. Uh, opened us up today. But um, there, there's some subtleties as well, um, especially when you're looking at, uh, well, again, changing people's behaviors, changing behaviors in a sustainable way. Uh, a lot of the things we think about in feedback that um, seem like the right thing to do, things like uh, rewards and incentives, um, overly positive feedback as opposed to informational feedback, uh, can have a negative effect on people's uh, motivations, on people's reasons for striving. Um, so in behavior change, we want that change to come from within. We want to empower people uh, to be ready to change their behaviors and to change them rather than um, giving them a reward or a, an external motivator um, to change their behaviors. So, so giving people information, giving people um, data, details, uh, encouragement, language that uh, is supportive rather than controlling 
um, all help people to change when you take that away. Um, when it becomes uh, feedback that's excessive or doesn't actually connect with the effort that they've put in, or when you're using gamification elements or real world tangible rewards, that can have a negative effect. People start to see themselves as doing actions or activities for those extrinsic motivators rather than doing it for internal valued uh, reasons. I mean, do you have a, like a, a story or an example of, of one time where you were, I don't know if you, you can talk about any of the work, but I just, I just find that so fascinating. Yeah, um, well, so in general in, in healthcare, uh, when you start to work with insurance companies or things like that, the tactic very much is uh, we want you to do this thing, right? We want you to, to manage your diabetes, for example, because your costs will be lower for us. So to get you to take those first steps, we're gonna, uh, we are going to give you a, a kickback on, on your um, rates, right? Be because you've, yeah, but yeah, because you've taken a, a health risk assessment or something like that. Um, and we've, and that seems to be like, you know, the mode of operation. And people don't like to take health risk assessments. They abandon them, they don't do it, they, people end up having to call people or do in-home visits, things like this. Um, so we've worked with clients, I can't say who, but we were able to convince them to remove those incentives, but design value into the risk assessment itself, right? Risk assessments now, they have no value for the person taking it. It, gets, it gives data back to the company um, that's collecting that data, but there's nothing there for them. So having uh, very long questionnaires, right? There's, you know, 40, 50 questions. Uh, you know, what is your, your blood glucose level? I don't know what that is, right? So you need to have information prepared. So it needs to be designed well. Um, but designing in a way that provides value, those feedback loops that give you something to learn as you go through, um, that do it, uh, we like to use a lot of um, playful design and, and you know, juicy feedback and things like that to make it feel you know, less like a task or a chore. What's, what's What's juicy feedback? Juicy feedback, yeah. <laughs> do I, yeah. I want to know? I mean, that, <laughs> right. sure. I mean, that's, there's that's there's actually asking. some, for it. some right, yeah, groundbreaking sorry. technology you can actually taste technology. through uh, through your phone coming out. So, uh, that's, uh, that's yeah, game design term, right? So typically in a in a, a form or something like that that you take, you spend 20 minutes filling out all these complicated answers. You p you push you know submit finally, and it goes, yeah, thanks, we received your. Uh, risk assessment, and you're like, wow, what was that? Um, but in games, it, it's like a little bit of input gives you big feedback, right? You know, it, it's not always appropriate. Stars and explosions and sparkles and rainbows uh, aren't always the design technique that you want to use. I'd like more rainbows, Dustin. You would like more. We, would, we all need more rainbows. Unicorns. And unicorns. But, but if you can amplify that feedback to make it feel a little bit more playful in the right context, again, finding the right balance, even very visceral aesthetic feedback um, within any kind of interactions, it helps. It, it, you know, it helps to drive along that engagement. It creates those, we, again, we reframe that as uh, you know, hedonic moments, but delight, right? So these little moments of delight which would build up uh, into the bigger picture of improving my capacity or setting some goals for behavior change and making progress. But, but that kind of juicy feedback um, within the end of a loop uh, you know, helps to retain that momentum and engagement. So I'd love to dig into that a bit more detail, right? So rainbows, awesome. Unicorns, even better. A lot of what we've been talking about thus far, and this is going to be a hard question, seems a lot like making effective products. Like, Okay, happiness is doing our job well. What is it that's special? What is it, so, so I'm a behavioral scientist, and my work is, is so much about what do we remember from that experience? What will become habitual? And so often the things that we do habitually, the things that are normal, we have no memory of. We, we, they're not, they don't become part of the fabric of our lives. So how do we do things that are different than simply making a good product. How do we really make our users happy? So I just want to push, push, push it back. I know we've gotten a few examples, and we can talk a lot more. Well, I mean, I think the simple answer is it's incredibly hard to make a good product. I mean, it's incredibly hard. <laughs> and like, I mean, think about the great products in your life. But what people have like what's a handful, great? maybe. What, what is it about great? I, yeah, it's not I mean, just, hey, you have 
man, you have really scheduled my calendar for the next month. That's an awesome calendar scheduling program. I can see all the boxes this month. What's great? There's something more about this that we remember that you think of in your mind that are vivid. Yeah, what and that, that's, I mean, that's why we developed the experience dimension. So, you know, our perspective is that there are five things. There's sense, which is like the emotional connection. There's control, about how much control do you actually have of the product. There's fit. Is it the right tool at the right time? So, you know, like a, um, a wearable watch, most of the time is a really crappy product. It's like it's the wrong tool for the Like I'm trying to read email on my phone, on my watch. It's a tiny screen. It's a horrible. It's a bad fit. Um, the, there are other applications probably that make sense, but there's continuity. It's how continuous, how well does it fit into my journey of my day, of my year, of my, of my family, of my, whatever the journey is. And access, does it provide something real and incremental? Um, but it's, a, I mean, it's a really, and it, you know, as, as you guys know, it all depends on the user. Uh, it all depends, we're all individuals, we're all special snowflakes, but it, we, there's some truth to that, that, that everyone has a unique mix of access, fit, control, sense that matters for them. Some people highlight one over another. When I think it does, it does matter the, the specific user. It also matters the, the expectation, right? So um, you know, if uh, if you if you make an incremental increase on a calendar scheduling product, right, um, you're not necessarily going to be different enough that it's going to be remarkable, that it's going to be enjoyable. Uh, and so it's taking new technology or new design uh, patterns, new design thinking, um, and pushing you know the the essential parts of it, uh, a particular workflow to make them easier, um, to make them more joyful, and then you know um, also make it memorable through things like juicy feedback, things like you know, um, uh, reaching back out to people um, and those types of, uh, of tools. But it's, it's, it's tough to be remarkable, I think. I think that the things that are made that one person is compelled to share with their tribe and something that's made that makes their life, not, not only makes their life so much better, but they're saying, I, it would be a disservice to my tribe and my friends if I did not share this product, place, service, or thing with other people. A, because you want them, you want their lives to be better, the people you care about, you want their lives to be better. But when you discover these amazing things, that is social currency. When you have an eye for experiences that make your world and other people's worlds better, and you can become a vessel for that, I think that that I think that, that, that if somebody's doing that with your product or service, I think that's when you know you have a great product or service. Okay, a little bit of that NPS piece in there, Dave, to your point. Yeah. Okay, so on, on, on NPS or related, here's another one that you may not want to answer. Benchmarks. Solid numbers for folks in the audience. Give me one metric and what you expect after an optimization process, after trying to really build for happiness, what's the change? Solid numbers. You mean the, the, the amount yep. of change? Yep, the amount. Give me a baseline. Give me an amount. What do you expect to change? If you're doing this really well, it doesn't have to be the baseline, actually. Just what's the change? Yeah, I can tell you a yeah. kind of a high-level story. So sure. um, uh, most of our clients are big. And, and anyway, so, so Nike, uh, 2007, uh, made a major strategic shift. Over the next five years, they cut their advertising, their traditional advertising budget by about 30% from 2007 to 2012, 2013. Over that period, their stock price, their stock value doubled, was up 200%, um, and their revenue increased 30%. Um, and what they did is they shifted uh, their investments away from these kind of traditional push advertising to building up the Nike Fuel Band and that, eco that whole ecosystem, to the point now where that ecosystem, and although they're, they're starting to actually let Apple basically do the product development and they're f shifting towards software, but the um, what that let them do is, you know, it used to be they would buy a Super Bowl ad. They'd reach 200 million users uh, or potential customers with a big ad. Now they get 200 million visitors to their site every week. And they were able to make that shift, and they were able to drive those desired results because of that uh, at, a, at a very strategic level, at a very macro level, through great products, through delighting their customers. You know, they just released a new, uh, a very special product for marathon runners that use the Nike tracker in their shoe. And they sent, um, they're sending boxes with actual patterns of the, most, of the most recent marathon that you ran to the people, you know, these people who buy, you know, a new shoe every, you know, every two weeks, every three weeks, who Nike knows intimately. Um, just really great kind of mix of, of different you know, new products, delighting someone, um, you know, trying to drive the business. So to draw out that particular metric, visits, are people actually coming back? 
and a significant increase or, or a decrease in the amount of time to get the same number of people, right? For reach, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. the reach, okay? Other concrete metrics that people can, can benchmark themselves against? Well, we do, um, in a lot of our, uh, the products that we design, we do, um, well, we do controlled tests um, within a population. So, for example, uh, a workplace wellness uh, program where um, typical strategies for getting, uh, you know, that your employer puts in place to get you uh, to be a little bit healthier, they typically, again, use things like uh, incentives or like the 100,000 step challenge and you get a $100 uh, American Express card or, or um, you know, posters or signs or campaigns around the office that says you should be doing something a little bit better. Um, that's a typical thing that, that companies do. We like to introduce new products into the environment that, that don't do any of that and, and test it with, with, half of, uh, with half of the company. So um, one particular product that, that we did a pilot with the American Heart Association is um, a little mobile app to get you up and out of your seat to be more mindful of sitting disease, right? The new smoking, we all spend too much time sitting. Um, so doing a pilot, half the company gets the email alerts and the posters and uh, the lecture from HR that they should be uh, taking breaks and getting up on the hour. The other one gets a mobile app, which is a, a mini game that gives you uh, short two minute activity breaks. Um, builds up your progress. You can pass these activities to people on your team um, or knock other people out of the team. So a little bit of strategy or knock them out of play. Um, and we saw uh, things like increases of uh, over a three-month trial, 80% uh, increase in physical activity with uh, the hot seat uh, group versus the, uh, the, the control pilot, um, uh, higher recommend, uh, recommendation satis satisfaction, uh, minutes actually spent uh, moving were, were much higher, um, and uh, something that we call the spillover effect too, where a two-minute break uh, leads to a 10-minute break, leads to a 15-minute break. So individual activities, but folks are grabbing people from the control group to go on a 15-minute walk once they've built the habit over, you know, over some time. So. So it can move things when, when you use design in a, in, a, in a good way. Nice. I think that's a great example. So a couple of things that we've seen are, are similar, increase in, in usage of the product, whether it's you know number of uh, times they, they log in. Um, so our, our more uh, engaged users log in about 150% more than, than regular users and use about 60% more of the, uh, the features of the product as well, um, which are, are great metrics that we also you know, constantly measure and test. And um, in addition, so uh, another story I can share is uh, prior to working at this, I worked at a financial company, primarily B2B, started having kind of reputational issues with, uh, with consumers. Um, and so we had we used the uh, ACSI, American Consumer Satisfaction Index benchmark, and we knew that in, in financial services, uh, it should be about 72 uh, out of 100 satisfaction with consumers, but uh, we were at about a 64. Um, very, very dissatisfied and, and we're having some, some uh, public uh, issues because of it. Um, and we found just, just through um, measuring, listening to feedback, actually acting on the feedback, learning what the, the most common uh, uh, tasks were that people needed to do on the website, we were able to get it you know, within, within six months up to benchmark, right? Which is um, sometimes a difficult thing to do within, when you already are starting from a, from a down on their, on their list a little bit. Um, but you know, knowing those benchmarks and being able to benchmark against other companies uh, can help you to alert uh, when there's a problem or, or an area that you're, that you're deficient. So thanks. I, mean, I know this is uh, often very uncomfortable for us to talk about, especially in a public setting. All right, this is what we actually move. This is what we saw, but it's very useful. So I really appreciate that, and I apologize for the somewhat difficult question. So at this point, I'd love to, uh, well, We've had, a, we've had a great discussion, and we can keep on going for hours. We'd love to open it up for additional questions. Um, as a behavioralist, I know it's sometimes difficult for people to start asking questions in the beginning. So if you don't, we'll keep on yapping until somebody raises your hand. OK, so that's a threat. Yeah, look at that. Have any of you done research on use of specific language to, to increase happiness? So for example, if, if I get a thank you note when I subscribe for an email, thank you very much for subscribing, versus, hey, you're awesome, we're glad to have you on our list. Have you done specific research on how much that makes a difference in terms of 
uh, conversion rates or uh, engagement with with customers. Yeah, absolutely. So that you know, to, to go along with the, what Dustin said about just kind of testing on certain populations, you know, doing controlled tests of uh, of any copy, right? Whether it's your your headline copy or your thank you copy, um, your your uh, feedback loops of you know um, telling people when they've done a great job, all of that can can net you know double triple um, uh, returns there, uh, and also just looking at. Um, those flows and how you can how you can optimize them. Sometimes, um, you know, just as part of the sign up process, how you how you make the first time user experience nudge them into the first action and taking that first step. Um, we saw uh, double double the rate of people starting to use the product there. Was, was it because of more conversational language, like my brother talks to me, or you know, it was just carefully crafted? Put this word first versus that word. Um, it was less like minor wordsmithing and more, you know, uh, it's got to be, again, again, remarkable, right? So um, it, it becomes almost about the, the attitude and the, how upbeat and how positive um, the, the, the product is, um, but also still juicy. still in a meaningful juicy. way. Word. Right. Yeah. For, right? yeah. <laughs> the, you want happiness, build juicy Dave, products. Dave, one point of clarification. Uh, how many folks know what a controlled trial is? Okay, so, so if you don't, could you quickly kind of explain what that is? Sure. Uh, controlled trial, I just basically meant something like an A-B test, right? So you, you take some group of the population and you show them one version and another group and you show them another version and see which one does the action you care about more. Right. And I think we may, I don't know if John, uh, John Whalen here is giving a talk later today. He may also speak directly to that. Are you speaking to that question at all? Okay, great. <laughs> he, he knows a lot about this. Um, the site Which Test One is the best quantitative source out there that I've ever found about these about these changes. So you can check that out. Uh, other questions? Yes, one, two. Um, quick question for Dustin. You mentioned psychological tools like DAS and something else. What were they, and what do they measure or diagnose? Or Yeah, those particular ones, um, uh, that was a depression and anxiety scale. Um, there, uh, for products and things like that, things like um, uh, Panis X, uh, positive affect, negative affect, um, we, uh, we use a combination, too, of... Um, uh, Framework, if you go to selfdeterminationtheory.org, uh, the framework that we use very much when designing products is that products that um, make people feel competence, enhance their competence, enhance their autonomy, right? Their, their volition, um, that they are in control of their actions. We spoke a lot about control. And relatedness, how can the product or the technology um, make better meaningful relations uh, with people through the technology and in the real world. So we use that as a framework. You can, there are scales that you can measure how people feel and all those. It, it comes down to intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic. And then for specifically for happiness um, or, or change, there are things, again, like the DAS uh, 21, uh, PSQ9 uh, is another uh, a scale that we use to, to measure things. Um, a lot of it, too, depends on the uh, what is the behavioral intervention that w that we're building? But uh, I can talk to you more later about specific scales if you're interested. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. Yep. And I think we had a question here, then there, then in the back. Over here. Um, I, I think we need a mic. Like, Hi. Thanks. Hi. Um, so early on, mm. you said that gamification techniques can backfire. Yeah. Um, but in what you were just saying about the activity increaser, it sounded like the uh, rewards, if you will, mm -hmm. were competition with others and and um, generally alerts and things like that. How how are those two things different? I mean, how do you avoid the the um, possible problems with gamification? Wow, yeah. So uh, we like games, not. I mean, I could take up all our time. We like games, <laughs> not gamification, right? So gamification, the typical blueprint have an activity that you want someone to do with your product or service or system. Uh, give them points so that they will do it. When they complete a certain amount of activities, you give them a, a badge, uh, throw in some leaderboards for competition that ranks those in a hierarchical manner, and throw in real world incentives, coupons, prizes, money, anything that they can use. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem with that, right? It, it is not at all what makes a game interesting or engaging. 
right? Games are about um, uh, expressing a sense of play, completing challenges, uh, the right level of challenge, mastery, surprise, novelty, curiosity, fun. That's, gamification is not fun, right? It's a sort of a, a Skinner box tool to uh, encourage particular kinds of behaviors. Very short term, uh, if any, engagement. So we like to build an actual game and operationalize that game to meet whatever goals that we're looking to meet. Um, I am probably lost the point of your question. <laughs> but um, uh, to your point about competition, things like that, you can even see in the games industry some of the most successful games at the moment uh, are cooperative games, which uh, instead of having, there's all kinds of risks uh, with competition as well. Um, it, but it seems to be like where everyone goes first, like, yeah, make it a competition and everyone will be engaged, especially in like health behavior and things like that. People don't want that. So you make it uh, uh, cooperative in this, this idea of shared goals, right? We're working towards the same thing. Um, creates that sense of, um, uh, uh, fosters meaning and compassion and, and relatedness uh, and support and all the good things from games. Um, as opposed to competition, which definitely can backfire and no one feels good we're on the bottom, you know, the top two people do. And yeah, I don't want to talk all day. Yeah, but. I just say that's been enormously influential with financial services companies now with, I mean, many of our, many of the larger firms are doing that. Sort of that's co-creation and motivation are two of the big themes that you're going to start to see in the products that you use. So I wanted to ask, um, Wow, it's a powerful microphone. Um, I've been listening, and there's a lot of conversation about behavior change, and um, I can't help but wonder about the ethics around that choice. Even the phrase, make people happy, sort of smacks of a certain amount of control. And I was wondering how um, you think about the user's uh, right to choose their experience and whether the fact that manipulating emotions um, m might have some ethical question, especially when you're looking to do it on the employer's benefit as opposed to the end users, or even as the end users. Thank you, an important question. So this is actually kind of similar to, uh, to, to where gamification can backfire, right? Um, there are absolutely ethical questions, and, and it comes down to the, the fact that if you're not helping somebody along a path that they want to go, if you don't understand their goals and their, their hopes and their desires, and, and, and if you're not driving that, then there's no reason for them to use your product. There's no reason for them to come back. Um, and, they, and, and any kind of nudges are going to seem just completely off base, right? Um, like the blogs that use gamification and, 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 and you know, try and use it as a one-size-fits-all tool for driving behavior, and you get there, and it's like, wow, I have a badge in a profile on this blog, and you know, I'm I'm really becoming a better person. Seventy percent, seventy percent, almost. <laughs> almost. Um, but absolutely, if you're if you're nudging people to to do something for the wrong reason, or that actually isn't good for them, then um, you know that's that's certainly an ethical issue. That uh, uh, your, if your users don't call you out on it, then hopefully you you, you stop before that. I think that's an excellent question that you pose as well, and it also brings up another question that I have, is that is it paramount that the things that we make make people happy? Or is it paramount that the things that we design so well should be invisible that allow people to get back to their lives and, and foraging their own happiness? Should these products and services and platforms that we make, I mean, if we're talking about users' happiness, it sounds like we're trying to make us happy, in which that's, that, that's not, you know, <laughs> those are two different things. So. Right. I, I, I have questions about that too. Should, if I design something, if I do my job correctly, you really shouldn't know that anything has happened. You should just be like, wow, like I have 15 extra minutes in my day, or I you know, got to see my kids more, or I, I, I ran an extra mile. I, it, it just, I, I, I have the same questions you do, so I'm, we're, we're unpacking it slowly together. There's one, there's one catch to that though too. No design decision is benign. It either thwarts right. or facilitates well-being somewhere down the road. And again, depending on where you believe uh, happiness or well-being goes, a medical model, a hedonic model, a eudaimonic model, it all comes down to well-being at the end of the day. Everything we interact with, all the digital technologies, all our interpersonal relationships that we have, they're all dialogues. They all affect our well-being in one way or another. So I would pose the question of, are the pro if the product and service that we are designing does not contribute to the well-being of the individuals, groups, or populations that are interacting with it, 
Does it deserve to exist? That's a question I take to clients all the time now. Besides, what's the line between care and control? Uh, autonomy support. If you design a product that someone is going to interact with that takes the, the person in the, the bottom position, right, the person that's interacting with it, if it takes their perspective, if it allows for choice in their inputs, uh, if they can interact with it when, where, how they want, that their goals are framed as their goals, uh, that the actions that they take towards achieving those goals, and if they choose to not interact, that needs to be coded as okay. Right. right? So autonomy support to me is the most important thing yeah. across and the I, board. This is something I feel very passionately about, and it's my, my life as well. Um, and a simple rule that, that we use in Hello Wallet in our work is if you were to make it not invisible, I think, Dom, your point is excellent. If you make it not invisible and you tell people, hey, this is exactly what we've done, will they be upset? Will they believe, okay, yes, you're improving our product. Hey, this, you're improving the product. This is great. Will there be a concern? Will there be even a whiff of, oh, wow, you're manipulating me? You've clearly crossed the line. There is so much good that we can do, which is about helping people, giving them control, letting them do something in their lives that so often we don't, there's no reason to cross that line, right? That we don't need to, we don't need to confuse those two issues if we keep that simple, simple rule in mind. Are we helping people? Are we giving them control? And is this something that they would be upset about? It is a fundamental issue in design that has been for hundreds of years in architecture. I mean, the room you're sitting in, the chair you're in, the lights, the, the structure of the door, everything has been designed. And all of it has implications. So it's a great question. So I know we have a, we had a variety of other questions, but now is the time to stop. I think this is actually a great point to stop because it gets at some of the profound issues of happiness. Why do we do this? Is it solely for the benefit of our companies to sell more goods? cigarettes and soap and whatever it might be? Is it to enable people to do something different in their lives? Is it so that they actually know nothing about what we've done in our design choices, but they just have more time back in their lives? They have a better experience, and it is transparent to the individual. We don't have answers to these questions, and that's why we have this panel, to raise that diversity of perspective and the diversity of experience that we are, we are as, as uh, Dom put it really quite beautifully, that we're unpacking together. And I look forward to that continued conversation with each of you. Thank you. Thanks.